Tonight is a very important one for me, and it is my pleasure and privilege, all protocols observed, to bring you greetings on behalf of my colleagues at the Joint UN Program for AIDS and from the Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV AIDS, whose wide regional and international members join me in congratulating the Right Honorable Denzel Douglas, founder and chair of the Global Lifestyle Foundation, as well as the board for conceiving and taking the necessary steps to make this bold venture a reality. Its success will depend as much on the support from partners and donors as it will on the creative leadership. I have no doubt that creative leadership is assured. And hopefully, Chair, ladies and gentlemen, you would permit me to demonstrate this in what I would call a tribute to the right Honorable Den Denzel Douglas. I have had the honor of working closely with Prime Minister Denzel Douglas for approximately 15 years in my capacity as the Assistant Secretary General at CARICOM and the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy for HIV AIDS in the Caribbean. I can attest to his unwavering commitment and effective advocacy for regional integration and to his outstanding representation of St. Kitts, Nevis, and the Caribbean community in the global arena. In his role as CARICOM lead head for human resources, health, and HIV, he was spectacular. It was under his leadership that the CARICOM heads of government formulated the Nassau Declaration, the health of the region is the wealth of the region, in 2000, and it was then determined that its two implementing pillars would be the Caribbean Cooperation in Health and the Pan-Caribbean Partnership Against HIV. He was one of the six original signatories to the inaugural PANCAP agreement and its chair from the inception in 2001 to 2014. During this time, PANCAP's achievements have been legendary. It was designated by the UN as an international best practice. It effectively coordinated a wide range of partners, governments, private sector, NGOs, people living with AIDS and donors, and mobilized over US 8 million for programs and projects. This resulted in a very, very important set of activities of which Dr. Douglas was an intervener. For example, from 1% of persons living with AIDS on access to treatment in 2001 to 50% of the population in 2014, and the reduction of deaths from AIDS in the same period to over 50%. But these indicators of the region's progress by themselves do not fully portray the exemplary role and massive influence of the then Prime Minister of St. Kitts Nevis. It was he who signed with six pharmaceutical companies at the International AIDS Conference, a document that led to a 90% reduction in the price of antiretroviral drugs from 12,000 US dollars per person per year to 1,200 US. <laughs> but that is just the beginning in Barcelona, as you saw from the video clip, he 
encouraged the Clinton Foundation to join PANCAP, and they did, as well as he forged an alliance with President Bill Clinton to, reduce generic, to introduce generic antiretroviral medicines to the Caribbean, which further reduced the price to 200 US per person per year. So when in 2005, Prime Minister Douglas led a CARICOM PANCAP delegation to Brazil that included Sir George Aline, then UN Secretary General Special Envoy for HIV in the Caribbean. He seized the opportunity to negotiate with the Brazilian president an agreement resulting in free antiretroviral drugs for people living with AIDS, all people living with AIDS in the OECS. This facility lasted until 2013, contributing in no small measure to saving lives and increasing the health and well-being of people living with AIDS. And besides, his advocacy for financing, prevention, and treatment, he piloted a regional Caribbean Justice for All program that highlighted the importance of reducing stigma and discrimination as prerequisites for ending AIDS, which is far from over. But it, <clears throat> but it was the Prime Minister who, in 2007, unhesitatedly supported the proposal to convene the first ever summit in the world of heads of governments on NCDs, resulting in the Port of Spain Declaration fighting to end AIDS in the Caribbean with 15 actionable recommendations. Championed by Prime Minister Douglas, both regionally and internationally, it became the blueprint for similar actions taken by the Commonwealth heads of government in India in 2008, the summit of the Americas in Port of Spain in 2009, and the UN high-level meeting on NCDs in 2011. National Wellness Day that you probably know of, with outreach to communities, schools, and workplaces, identified in that Port of Spain declaration, has been widely adopted internationally. But more importantly, the movement has engaged the establishment of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition that has focused more recently on the implementation of many of the elements of the Declaration. When the CARICOM Council of Human and Social Development recommended the merger of five regional institutions into one agency, it was Prime Minister Douglas that made the case and negotiated with the European Union for financial support for the startup of the Caribbean Public Health Agency inaugurated in 2030. In addition, the Prime Minister enthusiastically represented St. Kitts and Nevis and the entire Caribbean in the international theaters all over the world and is highly respected for his work and vision in health and other areas such as education, sustainable development, small island development states, and financing for development. These ladies and gentlemen are just a snapshot of the pedigree and the national, regional, and international acclaim of this diminutive yet towering giant. And he brings that to the role of chair of the Global Lifestyle Foundation, whose launch we are here to celebrate. I think in recognition of this giant, I want to ask you to stand and give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. And now I have the evidence. <laughs> and I could tweet, hashtag, massive response, standing ovation to my feature address.
at the launching of the last time. <laughs> but you heard from Dr. Douglas about the aims and organizational structure and programs, policies, and expected outcomes of the foundation. It is clear that the foundation has been formed not only because the market requires it, nor because some law demands it, but because he lived this experience for 60 years and with the board of directors came together to promote change combined with increased participation from citizens, communities, youth, men and women, girls and boys, and the marginalized groups in our societies. The foundation is being launched at a time of massive uncertain change. More specifically, the, most of the Caribbean countries are classified middle and upper income countries, and thereby in a, in a, in a, ineligible for concessional financing. But there are persistent threats to the viability of these countries, among which the vulnerability to climate change and exposure to national disasters. At the end of 2016, for example, 12 of 14 independent Caribbean countries had debt to GDP of over 60%. Public debt in the OEC, for example, OECS, uh, limits fiscal space for other types of spending, making it difficult, if not impossible, to reduce the relatively high levels of poverty and unemployment, and at the same time, containing the high immigration rates, especially of our skilled workforce. In these circumstances, civil society organizations and the Global Lifestyle Foundation in particular can play a meaningful role. It can play a meaningful role given the history of civil society in the Caribbean that dates back to the 18th century, which involves and evolves out of a spirit of voluntarism. During its earliest manifestation, I want to remind you, following the abolition of slavery, free villages were established by neighbors helping each other to erect structures, to farm, and to build roads and other civil works through voluntary service. Then there were groups of individuals initiating investment and saving schemes outside the formal banking system in the form of SUSU and Boxan and the pyramid scheme at a later time. The activities and main features of civil society organizations have significant, significantly changed since then. Trade union movements from the early 20th century, especially during the colonial and post colonial period, and professional organizations like teachers' associations were catalysts for leading great moments of change and movements similar to civil rights and black power in the 1960s and 70s, anti-apartheid that escalated in the 80s and the 90s, and more contemporarily, the articulation of gender equality that in the US has merged into the Me Too and Time's Up movement. This is the type of stand for human rights, therefore, that gives validity to NGOs and to civil society organizations who champion these changes. But just to place the global Lifestyle Foundation in context, there are three types of organizations comprising civil society in the Caribbean. Nonprofit organizations, non-governmental organizations, 
community-based organizations. We can all, they all have their own definitions. But I just want to say that these classifications are used sometimes erroneously, interchangeably. This is because the common characteristic in the Caribbean for these organizations is their voluntary nature, their independence of government and commercial organizations, and not generating personal profit. Most of these organizations operate subnationally and fall within one of the three categories, not the Global Lifestyle Foundation. Its mission and vision combines the characteristics of all classifications. Additionally, it is global in scope. Trust Denzel Douglas to go big. So how could the Global Lifestyle Foundation position it pro its programs in a region to accelerate and to make a difference? You may have heard about the CARICOM Charter of Civil Society, which provides a unique set of transformational aspirations. Heads of governments signed that charter way back in 1997. And the report of the West Indian Commission in Time for Action says the following, which I think is important. We attach much importance to this proposal for a charter of civil society. CARICOM needs normative moorings, and we found widespread yearning among the community for a qualitative character to the CARICOM community in which values beyond the routine of integration arrangements themselves can be judged and to which they can be made to perform. The charter can become the soul of the community, which needs a soul if it is to command the loyalty of the people of the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, as I listen to Dr. Douglas illustrate the vision and the mission. This is the soul that I think Global Lifestyle Foundation is striving after. But it's also worthy to note that in 2002, the dialogue between CARICOM heads of government and civil society representatives in Guyana offered much hope and inspired the Lillian Dahl statement of principles on forward together. And there was agreement that this would happen every three years and link the perspectives of civil society and the governmental heads of government in moving development ahead. This never happened. Never happened. CARICOM I think, ostensibly lost its soul. But there is hope, because there is a distinctly different experience from civil society in the recently concluded Eighth Summit of the Americas process, which concluded in Peru in April 12 to 14. The theme was democratic governance against corruption. And civil society was involved throughout the world, throughout the region, sorry, Latin America and the Caribbean, in a dialogue. But what is more important is that a critical set of recommendations resulted from a regional consultation leading up to the Peru summit under the auspices of the Caribbean Policy Development Center in Jamaica, and they provided useful guidelines. The theme of that consultation was civil society setting the 23rd agenda. And listen, 
counter-narratives and heterodox thinking. That was an interesting, intriguing title. But more notable was the out-of-the-box solutions to the challenges facing the Caribbean that were recommended, and which I also recommend to the board and members of the Global Lifestyle Foundation. It's this, among them, they agreed that timelines and targets of selected areas from among the 17 sustainable development goals must be part and parcel of the dynamics. That there should be an establishment of strategies for the pursuit of shared responsibility between private sector and public sector. That participation of civil society in the monitoring of government management should be essential. And that civil society must be involved in climate resilience. But more importantly, and subsequently, civil society supported the call of Prime Minister Skerritt of Dominica for making Dominica the first climate resilient country in the world. Now, imagine being part of that experiment as citizens of the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, the Global Lifestyle Foundation has identified its fields. And it seems to me that it must now chart the way forward. In charting the way forward, I would suggest that the foundation must include global solidarity as one of its planks to survival and sustainability. This means reaching out, understanding, and being active and visible in the international social movements for change. In this regard, the foundation may wish to become an active member of Civicus, an international nonprofit organization that is a global alliance dedicated to strengthening citizenship action and civil societies around the world. Its vision is of a worldwide community of informed, inspired, committed citizens engaged in confronting the challenges facing humanity. Most important, Civicus publishes an annual State of Civil Society report and has created a Civil Society Index, chronicling major global division, um, developments and key trends impacting civil society. It has representatives in New York and Geneva to liaise with the UN system. While registered both in New York and South Africa, Civicus has moved its headquarters to Johannesburg to better represent its primary constituency in the Global South. It is seeking as a result of the discussions leading up to Peru to place a sub-office in the Caribbean. Global Lifestyle Foundation. Just explore that. Because it could use the success of the Global Alliance of Civicus as a model to inspire the revival of the Caribbean civil society forward together. Well, it was about now in the speech that I was um, listening to with a former vice chancellor about 15 years ago, launching something similar to this, when he tapped me and said, you know, Eddie, that speaker is finished, but he don't know when to done. <laughs> Chair, 
ladies and gentlemen, let me try to conclude quickly. I am aware that the chair, you and the board of directors have already identified some strategies for bringing relevant programs on stream and for ensuring that they have the desired impact on improving social conditions for the people of St. Kitts and the Caribbean. I believe that the foundation is ideally conceived and its entry into the family of civil society could not be timelier. Its focus on the global means connecting people, ideas, institutions, and activities across geographical boundaries. It's projecting lifestyles as the essence of its programs and projects, means setting priorities for human development built on the pillars of healthy individuals, opportunities through education, training, and access to information to fulfill their potential, and mindful of the need to protect the environment and to promote peace, good governance, and prosperity. It seems to me that to achieve the benefits of global lifestyles, the foundation is required to involve experts, using research to guide policies and training, think tanks to encourage sharing ideas and best practices, and building new communications networks, including the social media, to engage new leadership, especially among the youth. It also needs to identify champions for change, functioning as the voice of the underrepresented communities, delivering services, working on huge social issues such as disaster management, climate resilience, and security, which includes reducing crime and violence and hunger. It also is required to utilize innovators to energize the foundation with ideas for developing new solutions to intractable social issues. But it also is required to develop the art. I think Dr. Douglas has developed that art. The art of keeping faith for causes that may take a long time to resolve, but keeping the faith. And it is required also to champion social accountability, which places a premium on transparency and honesty and, make, and making sure that everyone, from government officials to local school children, follow the same rules. These may sound lofty goals, but I believe that they are essential to the credibility and the success of the foundation. As the former UN General, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said at the Civil Society Forum in 2016 at the UN's launching of the Sustainable Development Goals, I quote, one of the main lessons I have learned is that partnerships are the key to solving broad challenges when governments, business, philanthropies, and civil society work hand in hand, we can achieve great things. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is my sincerest wish that Global Lifestyle Foundation achieves its vision and its mission, and that it goes forward to achieve great things. I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>